and you're watching the communicators on C-SPAN. We are on location in Las Vegas at CES International 2013 at the Las Vegas Convention Center. Here's some of our interviews that we did this week. Well, this week on The Communicators, we want to introduce you to Phil McKinney, who is the new president and CEO of Cable Labs. Mr. McKinney, what is Cable Labs? Cable Labs is the R&D innovation lab for the cable industry on a worldwide basis. We've been around for 25 years, and we're the source of the innovations that really enable the cable operators to deliver the services that you're quite familiar with, such as broadband, video, and now even voice over cable. You are not a cable guy. <laughs> no, I'm new to the cable industry. I uh, came from the consumer electronics, uh, but further earlier in my career I was uh, primarily in the telecommunications space. So I mean, I'm new to the cable. Well, you, Chief Technology Officer at Hewlett Packard, correct? correct. Mm -hmm. What do you think you bring to Cable Labs? I think from my standpoint, what I bring to Cable Labs and the cable industry as a whole is that perspective of not just the, the core technology, but how that actually gets used by the consumers. Um, in my role at HP, we focused a lot on what do people actually do with the technology in their homes, the technology in their hands, or the technologies on their desk, and what does that really drive from a benefit um, and productivity perspective. So being able to look at that from an end to end. In addition, I'm an innovator by, by background. So for me, it's about coming up with those really great ideas and then translating those into having high impact. What are some of the projects that you're excited about at Cable Labs? Well, Cable Labs, since I joined in June, we've been looking at all of the programs that we have currently running, and we've really narrowed those down to some key focus areas. One is, is the work that we're doing on new access network technologies. How do we go beyond kind of the, the speeds that we see today? Commercially, in the US, you can get upwards of 100 megabits today to your home through a cable operator. Next, you're gonna see that in 300. We just announced work on DOCSIS 3.1, which is the technologies out of Cable Labs, that will allow the cable operators to offer you 10 gig on the download and one gig on the upload speeds. And you'll start seeing that, you know, out years as, as we get those technologies refined, but that's kind of where we're seeing that progression. So higher capacity, better technologies on the network side, bringing you more capacity to watch those videos and, you know, communicate with your friends and all kinds of things. Is that going to take new hardware, new wires into the home? No, it actually take, it takes advantage of the investment the cable industry has already put in place. You know, the cable industry's got this great history of having made all of this capex investment over this period of time. All of that infrastructure that's in the ground, that coax that comes into your house, has you know, a phenomenal amount of capacity in it. So the technologies we're developing is it takes advantage of these advances in technologies and allows the cable operators to take advantage of the capacity they've already invested in. Phil McKinney, is the cable industry a growing industry? Do you see a, a long future for that industry? Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, it's uh, from the standpoint of cable labs, keep in mind that we have our membership is worldwide, not just the U.S. So if you look in areas like in China, there's estimations that there's going to be $30 billion of CapEx spend in the cable industry alone over the next five years. Even here in the U.S., we're still seeing growth. If you look at the, the growth rate in data usage from subscribers, from, from cable data services, we're seeing anywhere from 30, 40, 50% CAGR rates on an annual basis, and there's no slowing down. So there's just this insatiable uh, hunger for more capacity, faster speeds, and so the cable industry has a long, long future in being able to be that provider of choice for those services. When you look 10, dear, 10 years down the road, how are people going to be viewing video, viewing TV? Same way they are today? No, I think you're seeing that shift already. I mean, the role of the second screen in the living room. What, and five years from now, what's the concept of a channel? You know, today we think of channel as kind of being this linear, you know, up down on your, on your remote control. How many of us really watch, you know, linear television in real time. Other than if it's a sports activity, we've kind of gotten into this time shifting model. Now you're seeing this device shifting. I may record it on my DVR in my living room, but I wanna watch it on my tablet when I'm out and about. And I think you're gonna see just an explosion of the devices and the way consumers want to enjoy the content. They wanna enjoy it where they're at, when they want it, and they wanna see the content they want. They don't wanna be tied to, I gotta be home at eight o'clock, or I got to be tied to this specific device. So I think you'll see a shift in what's the concept of subscribing to a channel, and you'll see the shift as far as what device I want to enjoy it on. Phil McKinney, about a year ago, you published your first book, Beyond the Obvious. What's the topic? 
the book on Beyond the Obvious is really about innovation. I'm a believer that creativity and innovation is not a special gift. You know, you're not blessed with it and somebody else got skipped. It's a skill that anybody can learn, anybody can become proficient at, and everybody can benefit from, whether it's in your business world or even in your, your family world. Uh, so the book is based on the seven years of the podcast that I've been producing. It's, you know, I kind of lost track, 30,000 listeners of the podcast. Um, and this was basically to take all of that experience and, and information and, and make it widely available. Make it available to small businesses, all the way up to large organizations, so that all could benefit from basically revealing what some may think are secrets. It's just, it's basic skills and it's hard work. Innovation is not, you know, it's not the serendipity thing that everybody imagined it is. It's hard work, but anybody can become proficient at it. What's B-H-A-G, B-H-A-G? <laughs> B-H-A-G is a term I use for bold, hairy, audacious goal. What I found with teams, whether it be in R&D organizations or even the nonprofits that I'm involved in, is that if you really set the bar, you really define the, the really hairy, hard problem, the really lofty goal, if you set that and you define it properly, you will be amazed at how the human spirit is to achieve that and how people will, will come together around that common goal to really, uh, to really achieve that. You know, the, the, the space program here in the U.S. is a perfect example. You know, Kennedy laid out the objective of putting a man on the moon before the end of the decade. The entire country rallied around that BHAG. Any organization with a properly defined BHAG can achieve far beyond whatever they can expect themselves. What's a BHAG you've identified at Cable Labs or in the cable industry? Well, I think for the BHAG, for the cable industry, you know, are things along the lines of the transitions that we're seeing in the industry. You know, uh, all IP, you know, what does the network look like? You know, the fact of this explosion of devices. How do we transform the network technologies to be open to all these kinds of devices? Uh, some of the, the BHAGs that we're working on are along the lines of security, you know, privacy. Uh, new kinds of content sources. You know, the fact that content coming from traditional programming channels, the amount of content people are listening that are coming from non-traditional channels, what does that mean? What is it we need to look at? So we're in the, in the early stages of really defining kind of, you know, a handful of two or three of those BHAGs to really lift the entire industry. Well, I'm sure you're familiar with uh, webosnation.com, very critical of the uh, cable industry, and in fact, they say they've crunched or scrunched technology advances. What's your response to that? I would disagree. Um, I think, you know, from the standpoint of the cable industry, when you think about the amount of dollars the cable industry has invested over its entire span, there's very few industries around that have put that much dollars, capex spend, to build out a capability that's there. The challenge you've got is, is when you serve 98, 99 percent of all homes passed, any technology you inject into the network, you got to think about it on that kind of size and scale. You know, it's part of the challenge even in my previous life of when you're dealing with $40 billion of revenue, any new technology you inject, you have to think about it in the context of scale. And I think scale can be sometimes cause you to move a little bit slower than you would if you were a small little startup bringing in a new idea or a new technology. And part of what the CEOs from the cable operators who are my board for Cable Labs, what they clearly have, have tasked me with doing is, is picking up the pace. Rather than us taking four years to come out with a new technology, how do we do it in two years? Then how do we do it in one year? So one of the core premises that we've now laid out for Cable Labs is, is, is to really pick up that pace. Because we are the, kind of that early stage. We're the beginning of that new idea, the beginning of that new innovation that ultimately rolls into the cable industry. What differences have you discovered between Silicon Valley culture and cable culture? Well, I think if you think of the cable culture, cable culture is very, very entrepreneurial. People kind of discounted thinking it's just these big monolithic companies, but still a lot of the cable industry is still family owned. You know, think of the Cox, you know, communications. It's still a family owned business. The cable industry came up as family owned. So very entrepreneurial. They don't shy away from the risk of investment, but it's their own money rather than raising money from the standpoint of the, the, the traditional VC model. Um, what's also very unique about the cable industry is how well they cooperate. There's no other industry that I've ever been involved in where you can bring an entire industry together to have a conversation, get alignment, align those investments to, make, to get things done fast and, and in some form of cohesive way. Very unique. 
which in the case of Silicon Valley, you've got all these little companies all competing um, against each other. Phil McKinney, in your career, have you had to deal much with Washington and policy issues? I have in my past. I was one of the original executives for Telligent, which was a CELAC carrier based in Washington, D.C., Tyson's Corner. Um, so I spent my fair share on the Hill in front of the FCC talking about uh, you know, spectrum auctions and, and those kinds of things. But it's been a while. In my current role, I don't have responsibility for uh, policy for the cable industry. Uh, Michael Powell, who's the CEO for NCTA, um, who leads that effort for, for the industry. And Michael and I have known each other for many years, and it's a great partnership. What's the future of wireless when it comes to the cable industry? Wireless is actually a growing interest for the cable industry. Last May at the cable show in Boston, the cable industry announced the top six carriers coming together and stitching together their Wi-Fi footprints under a, a service we call Cable Wi-Fi. Um, so that's in the process of being built out. We've got you know, Cablevision, Comcast, Time Warner, Cox, et cetera, um, all bringing those networks together. So if you are a cable subscriber, and you have access to that Wi-Fi network as part of your service offering, and you have the ability to use that Wi-Fi even when you're outside your home. So the concept being is that people want broadband access not just in their home, they want great broadband access when they're outside their home. In the cable industry, we believe we're the best provider for broadband, and therefore we can offer that value-added component when you're out and about, and not just limited to being in your neighborhood, but being able to eventually be able to use that nationwide. Phil McKinney, back to beyond the obvious, you talk in your book about the importance of questions. Mm -hmm. Questions have a very unique power to cause people to stop, think, and look at something completely differently. Um, if I ask you a question, you can't stop yourself from answering the question. So if I ask you what's half of 13, you've now calculated the answer back listening to me. Uh, the answer being six and a half. The challenge though with questions, depending on how you ask them, is you build in natural assumptions. When I ask you what's half of 13, you assumed what did I mean by half and what did I mean by 13. So if I had written the word out, T-H-I-R, T and said what's half of 13, you would have split the word. If I wrote 13 out as Roman numeral 13 and said what is half, it would be 11 and 2. That's split vertically. If I split it horizontally, it's Roman numeral 8 and 8. If I had 13 as a deck of cards, the middle card is 5. Part of the challenge of questions is asking questions in such a way that you look at the problem in a way that you just never considered. And that's really the premise of the, the approach in the book. Is It's as simple as asking the right set of questions that cause you to look at the problem in a unique and different way. Can you give a concrete example in your career where that has been effective? Oh yeah, and uh, my favorite question that I use all the time is, is, what is it my customer not like about the buying experience of my product, right? So in my previous role at HP, I wanted to find customers who maybe looked at one of our products but chose a different product. Well, how do you find them? There's no list, people don't volunteer saying, oh I looked at, a, at an HP product and I chose you know, some other product. So what you found for seven years was me standing in retail on Saturdays, and I would watch customers look at our products and choose a competitor's product. I would then go up and introduce myself, hand them my business card, tended to freak them out, thinking that they were being stalked, and I would ask them, what is it you didn't like about the product? Why, what chose you to choose this other product? And we got phenomenal insights that we would just never have gotten had we not been there at that moment to ask that question. PhilMcKinney.com is the website in case you'd like to read some of his blogs or see his webcasts. What's a killer question? The killer question is, those, is that question that causes you to come up with an idea that just totally transforms, that creates something that's difficult to duplicate, high margin, and transforms both your career and the business you're in. When you hear the term TV everywhere, what does that mean to you? TV everywhere is that ability to watch your content anywhere on any device at the time you want to watch it, that you as a consumer are in control. Does it exist? It exists in forums. It's getting there. Uh, part of the challenge is things like uh, rights. Some of the programmers don't allow you to deliver the content. So, you know, the cable industry, we have to operate under the restrictions that we are put under from the people who actually own the copyright on the content material. But you're seeing it like HBO Go, great experience. You can sign up, you can watch your, your favorite HBO content 
you know, on your devices wherever you're at. Um, so it's getting there. The industry is moving slower than maybe some people want, but it's getting there. Is the package system from the cable industry, do you think that's a continue, continual product that will be offered? You mean as far as? Uh, offering packages, not a la carte or? But to be quite honest, that's really not a decision of the cable industry, that's a decision of the programmers. So the programmers control how the, all these shows get bundled together. You, know, you you've got to buy these five channels and it's part of the negotiations of, from the programmer set. So it's really not a decision of the cable industry. It's a really, that's, that's really a question you should ask the programmers. Phil McKinney, we're here at CES International in Las Vegas. When you've walked around the uh, show floor, what have you seen that you've been excited by? Well, obviously the big theme here at the show is 4K. The next generation which is Ultra HD, so it's twice the resolution of your HD TV today. Um, all the big TV manufacturers are showing, so think of it as you know, the transition from standard definition, your old TV to high def, you're going to see that jump in resolution yet again coming. Now, that technology is really not going to go mainstream for another three to four years. The, the, the TV sets are just very, very expensive, and we're still in the early stages of having content available um, at that resolution. But that's kind of the hot topic here at the show. But to be quite honest, some of the interesting things is healthcare. Uh, within CES this year, and every year they've done this, they hold what's called the Health Summit. And this year there's a particular interest in all kinds of sensors and biometrics, things that you wear uh, that not only help you if you want to get healthy and lose weight, but also sensors and technologies that allow you to do what we call age in place. So as we age in the population and you want to live in your home longer, these technologies would allow you to be monitored by both your health professionals and your family members so that you can continue to live an independent life. Lots of interest, particularly as we look at the baby boomers retiring, the importance of being able to use technology to augment that health care to ultimately reduce the cost so it co costs to, to have a, a fruitful life for much longer. Cable Labs is headquartered in Colorado, but opening up a branch office. Where is that going to be, and why are you opening it up? Yeah, you know, we've announced uh, that we will be opening up a lab in Silicon Valley. We are still looking for space. Target is to have that facility open um, in the midsummer time frame. The real purpose for the Silicon Valley office is is to expose Silicon Valley to really the the ability to innovate on top of the cable technologies. We believe we've got a great platform for other innovators to come and innovate on top of, and we want to make that as easy as possible and, and accessible as possible to the, kind of that startup culture that's in the valley. This is the Communicators on C-SPAN, and Phil McKinney of Cable Labs has been our guest. And you're watching the Communicators on C-SPAN. We are at the CES International Show in Las Vegas. Here's some more of our coverage. Well, joining us now on the Communicators here in Las Vegas is Charlotte Rath, and she's a vice president for Verizon. She's responsible for their wireless policy development. Charlotte Rath, is there a spectrum shortage? Well, that's a, a, an interesting question and obviously an important one. Um, is there a shortage right at this moment? Probably not, but spectrum, the process of getting spectrum out into the market is a very lengthy process and there is a concern that in three to five, ten years time frame there won't be enough spectrum to support the kind of development you actually see here at CES. Um, and it's, it's a very valid concern because, I mean, there's been an incredible growth in um, both uh, you know, mobile video, all sorts of um, different mobile uses. I mean, I think if you were to walk the floor, you would see a large portion of what you're seeing out here would in fact be um, mobile, portable, or whatever. And so, uh, three years ago, there weren't even tablets. Uh, you know, there's just, there's just a whole range of issues that we're seeing an incredible growth in um, use of, of spectrum. And no amount of, of um, innovation and sort of efficiency gains is going to account for, uh, you know, the, uh, you won't be able to solve the problem that way. So. So what's the best policy in Verizon's? In our view, I mean, in our view, it's a, it's, uh, there is no silver bullet. There are actually multiple uh, approaches to solving the spectrum crisis, if you will. Um, what, what you need to do is actually, I'm sure you're aware that the FCC has recently received authority to do something called incentive auctions, 
What that does is it actually allows them to buy, to provide incentives to current holders of spectrum licenses that may not have very much flexibility. You know, for example, a broadcaster who all they can do is broadcast, and they have a lot of rules that govern how they use the, the licenses. Well, so what if broadcasting um, over the air is not the wave of the future, and instead it's you know some sort of mobile, um, you know, mobile. Uh, service, you know, along the lines of what we do or some other, you know, companies might do. What this does is it actually says to the licensee, well, if you put your spectrum up for sale, you'll get, you know, some portion of the proceeds. And if the buyer comes in and they spend more than what the seller wants, then the commission has figured out that, well, the market has said that it's more valuable for another use. So that's, that's one way. We're also working very closely with the federal government um, on uh, how to actually move certain federal government uses off of spectrum that's very valuable for mobile uses. There are also a number of um, you know, efficiency gains that you can get through technology. For example, we launched our 4G network about two years ago, and it is much more efficient than the existing network, so it allows us to get more use out of the spectrum, so even that. And then, um, you know, just technology change generally, I think, will accommodate. But we also need to push policies that allow spectrum to go from, you know, very inflexible, uh, single-purpose uses to uses that are much more valuable to the consumer now. So shared uses, in a sense. Shared uses is one possibility, um, but we also believe very strongly that uh, a, an approach to exclusive use licensing that where the licensee has flexibility is a good way um, to, uh, is, is in fact probably one of the best ways to encourage economic growth and development. Shared use is almost like a, it's, it's important, we're working on it with the government right now, but it's almost like a last resort for us um, in terms of how we like to look at Spectrum. But I will say that given how, you know, deeply and, uh, you know, how, um, uh, intensively used the spectrum is right now, I think that there probably will be, you know, more emphasis put on sharing over the long term. Sure. Does that make sense? Yeah. Does the, is the government in, in Verizon's view sitting on unused spectrum that should be put into the marketplace? Yeah, I think, um, I, I think the, the straightforward answer to that would probably be yes, but it actually requires a little bit of um, background and explanation. A government user, they, ha they have a completely different use of spectrum than we would. It's very mission critical uses. It's often, you know, that, as they talk about it with public safety, is you may not need it all the time, but when you need it, it's very important that you have access to it. So there's, but there is this sense also among government users, if you think about it, they're not commercial users. They don't have economic incentives. They don't pay for the spectrum. They don't have to um, monetize it in any way. They can just use it and it's you know basically given to them. So as a result, they're not necessarily always thinking about how to make more efficient use of it. Whereas a commercial user has to think about that because we have to pay for our spectrum and we'd rather you know, if we can make more gains in efficiency by, you know, applying new technologies, building out, changing out to LTE, we would do, do that. The government doesn't necessarily have the same incentives. So bottom line is we do think that there's probably spectrum that could be shifted to commercial use to the benefit of the economy. What's, what's the science behind the uh, 4G being more efficient oh, or, or better? Um, can you... In I'm a, not sure I could... In a layman's way? In a layman's... I'm that? not even sure in a layman's way I could answer that question. Um, I should probably get some of our engineering personnel there. It's, uh, it's, it's um, something called OFDM that just makes, you know, a much more efficient use of the frequencies. So. There, there are plenty of people, you could go talk to Qualcomm and on the floor and I'm sure they could tell you how it works, sorry. Okay. <laughs> Charlotte Rath, what's the current um, status of the, uh, the deal between Verizon and the cable companies for Verizon to buy some of their spectrum? Uh, well that, actually that deal, the spectrum portion of that deal closed last summer. Um, we bought uh, nearly nationwide spectrum from Spectrum Co and Cox for you know, close to $4 billion, it's about 20 megahertz um, nationwide. And that actually closed and 
you know, we're ex expecting that sometime, I think probably sometime this year, uh, will be, you know, this year, maybe early next year, we'll be um, launching. So it'll be spectrum. online. It'll soon. be online, yeah. No, and, and what that is, we purchase that as for capacity. It doesn't give us additional footprint. It's just really, you know, in those areas where we are facing, you know, more and more of a crunch, we'll be able to bring it online and serve the needs of our customers. Well, as you know, when you sent out a tweet or a, on your blog post, you had mentioned how Verizon could use the Spectrum and use it more efficiently. Yeah. Quite a bit of feedback, and a, some of it negative. What's your response to that? Uh, Especially to, from T-Mobile. Oh, well, you know, it's an interesting, I, you know, you always have to sort of take everything with a little bit of grain of salt. It's, uh, you know, sometimes the competition, the competitive process takes place before the government rather than out in the, uh, you know, out in the marketplace. But, um, you know, what happened as a result of that deal, though, is T-Mobile, uh, we actually sold some Spectrum to T-Mobile, they sold some to us, they actually now have more Spectrum than they did before. You'd have to ask them if they think it's enough. Um, we actually still maintain that we are extremely efficient users. We have more customers per megahertz than, you know, than just about any of the other carriers. So, um, you know, we have close to 100 million customers. Do you think that there needs to be an update on laws governing spectrum from the Congress? Do you think the Congress understands the issues that you face? Yeah, actually, you know, that's that's an interesting question. I mean, they just almost, it's been almost a year that they um, adopted the most recent spectrum legislation, and I feel like what they did in that legislation was very good. It, um, it gave the commission sort of an extra tool in its tool belt um, by granting it incentive auction authority. And then in addition, it updated um, the um, commercial, commercial Spectrum Enhancement Act, which is the act that permits the government to um, use proceeds from the auction of federal government spectrum to actually upgrade their systems. So both of those were very good things. There, is there a, comp a need for a comprehensive piece of legislation? My view is, you know, not so much on the spectrum side. No, I, you know, and I won't get into the rest of it, um, but I'm sure there, you know, there are views that there probably is a need to update, you know, other parts of the act. But with respect to spectrum, um, I feel like what the, what Congress did last year actually really went fairly far in kind of resolving a few issues that have been outstanding for a while. How much of your day, how much of your work week is spent <laughs> with FCC type issues? Um, oh, that's actually, that's an interesting question. I am not um, somebody who is daily at the FCC. I'm in fact, my job is to be thinking longer term about what kind of spectrum may come on um, online in five, ten years, and how do we actually change policies to make that happen. So uh, right now I'm fairly engaged in FCC type issues because of the incentive auctions. But a year ago I was much more involved in legislative issues because we were talking about, you know, long term what to do with, uh, you know, spectrum policy generally. So. so Charlotte Rath, when you look five years down the line, ten years down the line, what what worries you? What What are you excited about? Uh, what worries me is that I don't want to be sitting in the same place I was a couple of years ago, going to the um, government and saying, you know, can we have more spectrum, please? It's It's. I'd like to see a, a process of spectrum um, management that actually is much more market driven, so that um, you know things like incentive auctions will continue to work. The, the commission gives more flexibility to existing licensees. Uh, the secondary market works in a you know a little bit of a smoother way than it does now. Um, but what excites me, quite frankly, is some of the things, in fact, that Lowell McAdam talked about last night at his um, keynote, which is really not what everybody thinks when they think about mobile these days. You know, a lot of times people go, you know, it's so your kids can, you know, watch whatever movies they want to watch and they can all do it at the same time. But this is really, in my view, this is about, you know, being able to truly be a connected society and in a way to actually deal with some of the other, you know, uh, shared success types of issues we talk about, which are you know, education, healthcare, and all the rest, all the things that he was talking about last night, that if you really think about it, most of 
most of them will be mobile. I mean, telematics, for example, if you're in your car, it's going to be mobile. But so often we view this need for spectrum as being related more toward, uh, to related more to uh, you know the need for you know more videos or YouTube downloads. And it, and in reality, that's not what we should be thinking about as a society. It's really to enable you know the kinds of interconnected healthcare, energy, education policy, and it's it's all going to be mobile. And if it's mobile, it, you need spectrum. Charla Rath, Vice President of Verizon for Wireless Policy Development. This is The Communicators on CISO. The Communicators is on location in Las Vegas at CES International 2013, the technology trade show. More programming next week.